Okay, uh, this is a very simple talk on the changes that are upcoming in SEO. Once upon a time, there was a guy called Ward Cunningham, and he used to do pair programming with people, uh, except they didn't call it pair programming in those days, and he used to uh, uh, refactor code, and charge them for refactoring code, so that term was not common in those days. Uh, and he wrote tests, and that term was actually known, but his tests were kind of different. And there was another guy called Ken Beck who looked at Ward and wondered why it was after Ward pair programmed with people, they seemed to be a lot more productive than before. So he eventually wrote a paper called Extreme Programming, and he produced three classes, uh, Test Case, Test Suite, and Test Results. And that all happened long, long ago in a galaxy far away. And then there was a council of a project called SUnit, and that produced a fourth class, Tech Resort. And this talk is mainly about the fact that the test resource I certainly has never quite has never quite played with the other three, uh, and hopefully now it will. Mm -hmm. And I will also talk very briefly about the fact that after a long, fairly quiet period, the SUNIC Caps Multiple Project is now just doing something again. Can you hear me now? Yes, you can. Okay, right, so I'm afraid you missed all my sparkling jokes, but <laughs> <laughs> that's perhaps just as well. Okay, so the first thing about test resource is it is an optimization. If you don't care how fast your tests run, there is no reason you would ever have one. So, about optimization, well, Kent Beck's rules of optimization are there. Do it later. And rule two, well, think about doing it later. Um, and that's fine, except that one of the practices of extreme programming is test-driven development. You're supposed to write your very small item of code and run your tests, and write your very small additional item of code and run your tests. And you're supposed to write tests, and then write your code, and you write more and more tests, and eventually you have a lot of tests, and they're not so fast. And if you take half a run test between every item of code, you are no longer uh, very fast. So then the second practice comes in, and it says refactor, refactor your tests fast. And it is in this context that the class test resource entered, and somewhat later, um, explanations of the class test resource also appeared. Um, but although it's a fairly simple singleton pattern, um, it never seemed to be quite clear how to use it, or at least um, I've certainly come across many, many examples of very, very bad miscoding of test resources, which is great because when I needed to test this, I didn't have to write any tests, I just had to run it on those examples, which were legion. Um, and I contend the reason the test resources often haven't been written particularly well is because the class wasn't quite fitting into the framework as it should. So what's wrong with a test resource? Well, first of all, XP is all about do it later, you won't need it to put off decisions, but test resources have a slightly different attitude. Their attitude is, I will set up every test resource right at the start. And so you run your few tests that are doing your test driven development, and then you go for a cup of coffee, or you go to a meeting, or you go home, and you press a button to run the whole test suite, and then you come back with your cup of coffee, or you come back from your meeting, or you come back next morning, and you see a little message saying that, I'm terribly sorry, but there's uh, one or ten tests in these 15,000 that happen to use this one resource, which someone else wrote uh, a month ago or a year ago, and it wasn't quite right for the particular environment you were in, so I did nothing. So that's, that's kind of irritating to come in the next morning and see that. Um, and the second point is, XP does say, well, you know, refactor it and make it run, make it run, make it fast, make it fast last. So you start by writing a test, and maybe you have a little setup in that test, and you have several tests, so the setup behavior migrates into the setup method, and then maybe you have a hierarchy of tests, and the setup behavior migrates up to the top of the hierarchy, and eventually you notice you have hundreds of tests all calling this particular item of code, and you think, maybe I should take that a test resource, it would be quite safe. So you move it to the test resource, and suddenly you discover that, of course, this code probably has calls of self-assert, self-deny, self, -assert, self -deny, self 
shoot rays, whatever. And uh, test resource doesn't understand any of that, so you have to try and rewrite your code um, simply when you're doing optimization. So that's very irritating. So that's bad if you have one test resource, and it gets a lot worse if you have two test resources, because first of all, they can compete with each other. I mean, a very natural situation is to have a system which can only connect to one database at a time. Um, but you may have a production database and a test database, and you have some tests that run against the production database to make sure it's clean, and you have other tests, and you don't expect those tests to pass on your test database, and you have other tests that you run against your test database, and they do very aggressive things, and you don't want to run those tests against your production database, and so on and so forth. And now you can't just put all your tests into one big suite and go home or go to your meeting or go to get your cup of coffee and run it, because um, uh, they don't agree, they compete. I, can, I want to connect to this database, but I want to also connect to that database before I will run any test. But I can only connect to one database at a time. So I coded up our competing resource pattern, and Stefan has also coded a solution to this, and Martin has coded a solution to this, and none of them are, were easy to write, and um, even the ones that plug in seamlessly in one sense, if you look at the code, you will be deeply puzzled, or at least put it this way, when I look at the code, I, I'm deeply puzzled and I wrote it, so um, it was not too easy. And that's if they compete, but it gets a lot worse if they start cooperating. Because if they cooperate with each other, then you know you might think it was natural, the resource that says I need to connect to a database, and another resource is saying I need to add a lot of test data to this database, and then rip the test data out of the database and disconnect would work. But in fact, the wonderful um, test framework is written to ensure that this will not work. If you try to drop a hint in your test that there's a right order for running these things, then it is in no sense guaranteed that they will be run in the right order. And if you actually try to drop a stronger hint and make one resource depend on the other, you are absolutely guaranteed either, if you use the most intuitive order, that it will try to add data to the database and then try to connect to it. Um, or alternatively, if you use the stupider and less intuitive and less configurable order, it will at least connect to the database and add the data, but then it will disconnect from the database and then try and tear down the data, which was not very sensible. So, um, yeah, in, in, in many ways, the, the resources had some, some slightly distressing features, which uh, might naturally have understood why people did not use them as much as they did, or did not use them as well as they did. Okay, so the issue is now starting up again, and this was the first thing for us to fix. Um, Sam and I worked on this, and um, now resources are made available just in time. The first test that needs a resource will prompt it to set up. All subsequent tests that need it will simply check whether that setup attempt succeeded or failed. Uh, those tests that need a resource will then run or will simply report that they failed for lack of a resource. Those tests that do not need that resource will still run. So 14,900 of your 15,000 tests will run when you come back next morning. Uh, the resource will certainly be torn down at the end of the run, but you can now quite safely tear it down at any time. A test resource is an optimization. It's a decision to trade off test isolation for performance. Normally, a test sets out everything, and then it tears down everything. To make a resource is to say, for some reason, I don't want my database connection to be set up and torn down. It might be because it's very slow to do, or it might be because actually incessantly tearing it down very fast actually gets in the way of running your test. Maybe your particular database doesn't like having resources set up and torn down at extreme speed, because that's not the, the environment that's optimized it. For, for whatever reason, for some reason you think it's safe to connect to the database, run all your tests and disconnect, and you don't think that it's necessary to set it up and tear down your tests. You think they're doing things that don't affect that, so you are prepared to make that trade. The new system gives you the option of saying, well, actually, for most of my tests, that is a sensible enough trade, but this particular test is testing something such that it really wouldn't be a good idea to run other tests after it using the same database connection. Uh, maybe I'm testing and putting the database connection into a really strange state. So you can simply tear down that resource. The next test that needs a resource will see that it has been cleaned out again, and we'll set it up. So you can, you can decide what trade is good for you. Second point, resources now understand the CERN. They understand the whole protocol that they ought to in order to be a fairly painless and seamless refactoring of code from the setup part of the test method to the setup part of the resource. And finally, you get some sane ordering. So you will connect to the database, then you will add the test data, then you will tear down the test data, then you will disconnect from the database. So sanity occurs. So 
All this is an extremely trivial refactor, which I now show. Um, yellow means added, red means removed. So what happens is you can see very much in a test case as run case, you can see how code could move from the setup of that test to the resource. The resource is simply calling the standard protocol and saying, am I available? And if not, it will raise a sensible error message. Um, and this is a, a definitely desirable replacement from the original code which is ripped out and which didn't even live in the insure block. So uh, if anything went wrong with your resources, you were guaranteed that they were all left set up. So time out of mind. Is there more to it than that? Because there is a bit more to it than that. Okay. It's, it's not quite as trivial as, as it looks. Yeah. Um, it's pretty trivial, but it's, it's not quite. It just seems that if you run it outside of the test suite, the resources won't get thrown down. If you run it outside of a test suite, the um, resources will get torn down. If you send run to test case, I have made a few other changes, which I'm not, I'm not going to show you every single item of code. Test cases. There's run and there's run colon, and when you run a test case, you send it run. You don't send it run colon, that's what a test sweep send is. And your run to a test case will tear it down. So you have guaranteed tear down on all the public API. Um, so you'll notice, yes, here, where it says self run colon result. That's how a test sweep <coughs> test to run, so that it is using the aggregated test result. When you ask a test case to run, that run, no colon, creates a test result. And one of the things it also does now is tear down resources. So you're, you're guaranteed on the public API. But a very sensible question. OK, so I, and I was just saying you get a sensible uh, error message and you get more sensible tear down. Um, it was very tedious with the old resources. If you had a dozen resources that all added test data to your database, and any one of them went wrong, all of them left their test data and were still in the database, which is quite tedious. Okay, as for working, it's a very trivial three-valued logic behavior. Um, if current is nil, then the resource will attempt to make itself available. Uh, make available, the first thing it does is make sure that current is not nil. Then it does all the work of seeing if the resources it needs are there. Then it tries to set it itself up, verifies it succeeded. And at the very end, it makes current a valid value. Uh, all subsequent checks are simply an utterly trivial check, and this is already available on the bottom of the slide of whether the value is valid. So it's, it's hopefully a very straightforward, very simple uh, change that makes them more robust. OK, so it's growing a little bigger, but I don't want it to grow any bigger. You have now got an abstract class, super class of test resource and test case. And we think that's good, partly because it's obviously less work to add a new class definition than to actually clone all the assert protocol. Also because, in addition to refactoring behavior between test case and test resource, it can be quite sensible in a complex test to want to refactor behavior out into some kind of delegate that is doing some common task, which might just be an ordinary subclass. And now you have, if that delegate runs inside the test handler, you have a suitable uh, superclass to use for that work. So I think it does online and help the test. Okay, so we're, we're growing a little bigger, but I seriously do not want it to grow by much bigger. Now, Tudor last year in his excellent talk said you should only ever have... Oh, sorry, one, one thing before I get on to the final message. Okay, so any, any downsides on this at all? Well, there are two things you need to know in, uh, about these changes. First of all, uh, does anyone here use the basic and default logging? Methods. Does anyone here override is logging or is failure log? That is the answer I expected, which is why I was very casual about making this change. So for the record, um, they're now on the class side, and if you have any class tests that override is logging or failure log, they need to be class side overriding is logging and failure log. So if you want to run them with 3.1 and 3.2, then you just leave them in both places for a while. Okay, that's trivial. Uh, another point to be aware of is, of course, we're moving the behavior slightly. So if you profile the actual call of a test method, it should not behave as before. If you profile an overall test suite, it should behave as before. But if you happen to have profiling behavior that uh, is located around the run case or uh, just outside the handler or something, then, of course, some tests, before they get into their setup, will uh, run the resource and then all 
Sussman test, will simply say, oh, are you valid? Yep, carry on. So that may affect profile, it's important to be aware of. Uh, and yes, there is a gemstone release and a visual works release coming along very soon, which I hope will have these. So this particular 3.2 is about to become moderately set in stone, so if there's a problem with other as they'll say as well. Definitely yell, yell at me during this conference. Okay, so as Tudor last, last year said, have one message. I actually have two messages, so this is the first message, which is basically make it run, make it right, make it fast, also applies to your tests. Uh, resources now, I hope, are slightly more useful for that last bit. Uh, and I'd like to say thank you to all the people who have ensured that um, by the end of this conference, uh, this will be in VigorWorks and Visual Age and Squeak and uh, Dolphin and Gemstone. Uh, and if it should be anywhere else, well, <laughs> the other message is after a long quiet period, SUnit will be getting up and moving. Um, the purpose of SUnit is to be cross dialect, backward compatible, and small. Uh, there are a whole bunch of add ons. There are add ons to let you deal with tests that raise their errors in small subthreads. There, there are particular patterns for using resources. There are a whole bunch of UIs all over the place. There are other frameworks which uh, based on SUnit, it does stuff. For example, there is the SUnit 2 framework in VisualWorks, which is an excellent place where we can try out ideas that we are then perhaps going to move into SUnit S generally. And there's a bridge you can load to format those tests. Those of you who were here last year will remember Aldress Assessments, uh, where you've got a very configurable framework which can actually have completely transparent bridges, no you know, change of the classes, uh, for, you know, both those frameworks and probably any other framework you can think of. Um, the Gemstone people I know have a test framework which they haven't yet charged for client side uh, normal GUI testing uh, for various reasons to do with limitations in SUnit, which um, haven't been removed yet in 3.2, but very possibly will be in 3.3 and afterwards. <coughs> and there are loads of others. So we are definitely in the business of getting ideas. If you can see that a minor change to SUnit would make it much easier for me to plug in a particular behavior you want, we want to know about it. Uh, the only thing that will cause us to be cautious, but it will cause us to be very cautious, is SUnit's job is to be cross dialect backward compatible, and small. All the other frameworks whose job is other things, but that is our, that's our mission. Okay, so, questions? Um, why, why would I um, have an assert in my, my setup or a test resource? 
I'm not sure that I think it's a good idea. Can I answer? Yeah, go for it. So, because test resources can fail, what you want to be able to do is say you're connecting to a database and you want to make sure the database is in a state that will be valid for your tests. So in that case you can now assert that that's the case before your tests run. If the resource fails the assert, it's not set up and those tests won't run now. So, so self-assert DB is online might be a very natural, and indeed I think some of the store-based tests, it's exactly, exactly that, you know, did I get my connection to store? Uh, second question, uh, um, where, is, where is the home of uh, the, the cross-dialect S unit will, will be? Is it on the... That's a very good question, I'm so glad you asked. Um, right now, we don't quite have an answer. There's an old home on SourceForge, but there may be good reason, which, which is older, you will not find this there just in a moment. There is probably good reason it should move. Um, to be determined, and you will see announcements on Planet Small Talk and all the usual places. Uh, meanwhile, in the Syncom OR and in uh, Bast goodies and BA goodies um, and in uh, all the other locations, it will be. So I think partly we'll be interested in having it in the dialect natural locations, but we will also try and set up a new one. The old, the old one, I think, sort of work is doing some change. Concurrent. Oh yes, yes, sorry, that's exactly this, uh, the S unit next proc patterns. Um, if, if that's what you're asking, the, you spawn a process, the X proc pattern uses method wrappers to put the, the same handler that you wrap the test with round all the processes that that test spawns or that it's things it spawns, spawns, etc, etc, etc. The result is that every error that is raised comes back. There's what we call a procrastinating semaphore that uh, it then waits on with a timeout because obviously your, your threads may never complete but uh, you, you just you, you make your test say I think this test will take five seconds or I think this test will take five seconds or whatever. Um, but it will, it will run until those threads complete or until the timeout happens and then you will just see red or uh, you will see failure or not. So you avoid the situation where you raised a uh, you fire off the test, you come in, the test is saying green, but you have this debugger up. And if you went home after running 15,000 tests, that's very annoying too, because you come in and you think, well, one of my tests raised that debugger, but I wonder which one of the 15,000 it was. Uh, you have to sit there watching. You know, so. so yes, that, that, that pattern is in VisualWorks, and uh, it will be our task to port it to VA, to Squeak, and so on and so forth. Anywhere, anywhere that has method wrappers can have that pattern. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we have a, our own subclass of test case where we've added a lot of things. And I think we, we added uh, class site setup and teardown that only happens once for the, whole, for the whole set of tests in that test case. And I think that's how we, we use that instead of using resources because we probably never figured yeah. out how to use resources. Do you I have a kind of guide of how, what should be migrated from your setup methods to a test resource? Yes, I think I remember that. It was around a few years back. And yes, I'd be happy to sit with you and um, show what you could use. Obviously, some people will have coded valid solutions because this one has been somewhat tedious for a long time. And of course, you, you may just decide to go on using them. I mean, they, they work for you fine. But yeah, I'll, uh, sit with me afterwards and I'll, I'll gladly go over them. Okay, in that case, uh, thank you very much.